was born to experiment. Even when I was far too young to know what I actually wanted to do, I automatically took the empirical approach. Get out there and collect data on everything. So I tried spelling bees, I did math camps, art clubs, theater groups. I even thought I was going to be on Broadway for a while. That was my ambition. But then I experienced my first science fair. I was in sixth grade. My project was a simple one. I was testing out some unconventional antibiotics on bacteria grown in petri dishes. My project board, as you can see, is mostly handwritten and all in eye-watering neon. I felt this to be the height of scientific professionalism. But what was so incredible to me about that experience of science fair was that I was asking a question I could test. I was working through the difficulties of coming to some sort of meaningful answer, and then I was just discovering more questions. It was then that I knew that I was stepping just, just a little ways into the unknown, and that sent shivers down my spine. Plus, I got to see some of the work that the high schoolers were doing at this fair, and wow, it blew me away, the type of work that kids just a few years older than me were able to accomplish. And it was in that crystallizing instant that I knew that this was my life, this was my dream. I wanted to be a researcher. So when I was 12 and looking for some ideas for my next science fair project, I read online that with some old vegetable oil, a few chemicals, and a bit of patience, I could make biodiesel in my kitchen. Now, biodiesel intrigued me. It's a renewable alternative fuel that's made from natural oils, but it can go straight into a regular diesel engine. It's clean, it's carbon neutral, and if you use old cooking oil, it even smells a bit like French fries. So kind of fun. With uh, my parents' permission, I actually started making my own biofuels at home, experimenting with reaction types and oil conditions in the backyard. Biofuels were really this perfect fusion of my passion for biochemistry with my interest in alternative energy. But I would find an even better fit in ninth grade the emerging field of algae biofuels. That's right, pond scum can make petrol. And it's better at it than other crops. Algae are fast and efficient oil producers. But more importantly, they don't take up food land to produce fuel the way that corn and soybean fuels do. Now, the real problem with algae is an economic one. They simply aren't yet competitive with fossil fuels. And that's where my work comes in. I'm trying to increase the oil yields of algae to make them into a feasible alternative. But algae work isn't always smooth and easy. About a year and a half into my algae research, I hung all my hopes on this rather sensitive experiment involving some molecules that break down pretty easily. So I painstakingly collected my samples, I treated them, uh, my mom drove me the three hours across the state to the lab where I was working in, uh, I spent all day analyzing to find nothing. All of my samples had broken down. I spent a few months going through the process again. This time I used several convoluted storage methods. Again, there was nothing. The entire cornerstone of a whole year of research was gone in a single failed experiment. I was almost in tears as I left the lab that day. So I had to restructure. That year, I actually ended up presenting results from a different facet of my work. And soon, I got onto a different tack entirely when it came to making algae overproduce oil. See, I knew that other researchers were looking at using difficult genetic manipulations or temporary environmental changes to try and get algae to produce or store more oil, to varying degrees of success, because the mechanism by which algae make oil is relatively complex. So instead, I had the idea to let Mother Nature take care of those fiddly bits for me. That is, instead of changing one particular gene, I instead changed the environment that the cells were living in so that in order to survive, they had to overproduce oil. In order to pressure these populations, I used a chemical, a type of herbicide, in fact, which kills cells if they don't produce enough oil by blocking an extremely important reaction in the process of making oils. 
So the idea behind uh, the way this whole scheme works, artificial selection or guided evolution, is that if you have a very large population of cells, and we're talking 100 million cells per milliliter in a dense culture, you have this large population, then you're going to have some variant cells, some cells with unusual characteristics. And this genetic diversity is the basis of my idea, because just such a variant cell might just have unusually high oil production. Now, normally this cell is nigh invisible in this large population, because it's so rare. But if you add just enough herbicide to kill only those cells with low oil production, suddenly that high oil production becomes an extremely successful trait. And over time, the entire population has to shift. It has to evolve to look more like that rare high oil cell. It has to improve its oil production or die. It's survival of the fittest. So this was the model that my work designed, implemented, and tested over the past two years or so. And as you can imagine, a great deal of experimentation went into developing this process. But uh, eventually, it all seems to have paid off. Those three tall bars on the right are the oil content for some of my artificially selected cultures. And if you compare that to the small blue bar on the left, that's a normal culture. So what we see is that I've been able to, I think, uh, increase the oil yields of these artificially selected cultures through a lasting genetic change, which basically means that I've been able to increase fuel yields of these cells. In the end, this result really came down to persistence more than anything else. When I first got into science fair, I was so worried that I wouldn't be able to do real research if I weren't in a real lab all the time with real scientists. I heard about other kids' research classes and formal school-sponsored mentorships at these competitions, and I heard, had this sinking feeling. I thought, do I even stand a chance? But I found that even without a formal mentorship or without specific resources or training in an area, that's no barrier to asking and even answering a meaningful scientific question. In fact, I was able to answer most of my questions from my bedroom. This is the lab that I built under my loft bed a few years ago <laughs> to culture my algae. <laughs> I've got flasks bubbling next to the microscope I got for Christmas. Uh, I've got chemicals and measuring devices, a really clunky, noisy old centrifuge. I even sleep on my algae's light cycle. 16 hours on, eight hours off. <laughs> but of course, there were some resources that I needed that I couldn't find in a typical bedroom. So I emailed scientists for advice, for, with, with pleas for lab time, with questions. I ran into a lot of closed doors before I found a few wonderful open ones. And once in the laboratory, it was still a challenge. I had to spend days or even weeks of troubleshooting even simple protocols to make them work. Yet everything worked out in the end. I love it so much. I mean, long commutes, the difficulties of stocking my bedroom with all of this biochemical paraphernalia, even the challenges of maintaining analyses despite this sporadic lab time, none of that could put me off research because I just love science too much. <laughs> but many aspiring researchers face the challenges that I have, and it's not an easy thing to look past. In many ways, I was lucky. Things fell into place for me, but they so often don't. I believe that we need to provide better resources to young people, better resources, better tools for them to be able to conduct scientific inquiry of their own. The world rests upon the shoulders of these young minds, and science is the tool with which they will change the world. Science is a method. It's not a single magical protocol. Here's science redefined. It's something you do, not something you learn from a textbook. So, in a way, I think we're all scientists. That's what being human is all about, trying to learn more and answer mysteries, whether you're a linguist or a painter or a biochemist. You're a scientist if you're answering questions. And a beautiful mind is one that doesn't just ask questions. Anyone can ask why. A beautiful mind is one that tries to answer, too, that designs a plan 
to challenge the universe, to disturb it to the very core by forcing it to answer you. Finding a solution isn't just about curiosity. It's about having the determination not to let the darkness and the danger of the unknown phase you. And research is this key to unlocking the mysteries in our grand, amazing universe. It's, it's the method by which we're able to achieve a meaningful understanding of our world, by which we make innovation and invention possible, and by which we can come to terms with the underlying and fundamental truths of nature. Even if algae specifically isn't the panacea for our energy crisis, science is.